My name is Bahar Sayedi. I'm a Senior Sustainable Development Officer at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And I am delighted to moderate this event on ensuring universal access, universal energy access and just energy transition from the summit of the future to the SDG7 review and HLPF 2026. This event is organized by UNDESA in collaboration with SDG7 TAG, Technical Advisory Group, as well as UN Energy. And just to, before I, I pass the floor on to the co-chairs of the SDG7 TAG, which we are delighted to have with us today, uh, just a little bit of background on the context for the session. So as you all know, SDG 7 is at the heart of the 2030 agenda, as well as the discussions currently going on at COP29. Now, um, the next review of SDG 7 will take place in 2026. And this discussion today will focus on the, the opportunities and challenges that we have ahead of us. Um, as we move forward towards uh, progress on SDG 7. As you know, um, we are not on track with the targets, uh, whether it's universal access to energy or energy efficiency or en renewable energy, and we need to uh, see accelerated progress to ensure the achievement of SDG 7 by 2030. Now, without further ado, let me welcome um, Mr. Hans Olaf Ibrick. He's the Special Envoy for Climate and Security from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Norway. He's also the co-facilitator of the SDG 7 TAG. I also would like to um, introduce Ms. Sheila Oparacho. She's the Executive Director of Ener Energia, and she's also the co-facilitator of the SDG 7 TAG. I believe Sheila is um, joining us virtually. Hans Olaf, over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Bahada. First of all, I'm uh, having a really bad cold today, so I'm not quite sure uh, what I will end up uh, saying. And I will also try to be a little bit brief, even though this is a topic that I feel really strongly about. So. I could have probably spoken a long time, but first of all, let me thank you and Dessa for convening us. And also let me thank you and Dessa for establishing the SDG7 Technical Advisory Group, uh, which is comprised of about 40, 50 members from various organizations, including member states and civil society, which I think is actually a, a great group. And Sheila and myself, we've been co-facilitating this group since uh, the start and we still have the confidence of the members so we'll, we'll at least we will continue for another year but first um, let me provide some opening uh, remarks that uh, also Bahari touched upon that energy is an, an enabler of development and there are actually no high income country with low and, and at the same time being a low energy country if you look at these statistics it doesn't exist a high income, low energy country uh, because in essence, our electricity consumption and income per capita is actually correlated and it's a really nice correlation. Unfortunately, access to clean cooking is not correlated necessarily with income. So that means and underscores also the point that we need different approaches. Um, um, and if you look at energy, it's not only linked to, to economic development, but of course it's enabling also a host of other SDGs, and we call it the interlinkages in terms of, of course, gender, health, food, education, etc. So the interlinkages between SDG 7 and the other ones are quite uh, stark, and then that's also an area that the SDG 7 tag is focusing on. Uh, given the mandate, which is basically to support also HLPF. So now we are moving actually towards a world that runs on electricity. And of course, that's also at the heart of SDG 7. But as Bahara said, we are way off. And I personally think it will be a really hard task for us to achieve SDG 7 by 2030. I think it's nearly impossible, but we still need to keep the eyes on that target. It's important uh, politically, so we cannot give up uh, right away. 
Of course, our access to electricity, we are not doing too shabby. Clean cooking, we are way off. Renewable energy, we are actually heading in the right direction, albeit not at the speed at we have wanted, but at least we're making some progress. And energy efficiency, we are also way off in terms of, of achieving that target. We all know that we are faced with considerable headwinds uh, when it comes to implementing SDG 7 and also the, en the energy transition at large and achieving our go global climate goals. I don't need to go into details, I can just mention some keywords in terms of geopolitics. We have increasing technology competition between some of the key larger countries. Uh, we have also created new dependencies in this area, especially in terms of uh, technologies and minerals, and I'm thinking of China in, in particular. And of course, then we have climate change, change impacts that are getting larger and larger by the, by the minute. There's also general lack of cooperation. There's lack of investments, especially investments flowing into the least developed countries. Africa get less than 2%, maybe even less than 1% of annual uh, renewable energy investments. And it's quite clear that now we risk that the divide between uh, developed and developing countries and some uh, emerging markets that are charging ahead will actually be, be wider. So, and that's a serious concern to all of us. And I think it's also fair to note that increasing government budgets in most countries will be under pressure. But there are some bright spots in terms of um, last year we got together and agreed to triple renewable energy and double energy efficiency. I've always said that that's for me it is SDG 7 but if I might say so, so at the climate cup but our climate colleagues have actually discovered SDG 7 because if we had achieved SDG 7 there was no need for this tripling and doubling targets. According to IEA, we are not too far off in terms of achieving a tripling target by 2030. So we are definitely heading in the right this direction. Overall, also we see investment flows shifting from the bad to the good in terms of from fossil fuel to renewable energy. And earlier this year, we had a clean cooking summit in Paris organized by IEA, Norway, Tanzania and the African Development Bank that actually brought together more than 1,000 people to discuss clean cooking. And normally when I've discussed clean cooking, it's a room like this and only a large handful of people. So that was at least potentially then could be a game changing um, uh, summit. And also hopefully that this will, will uh, also come out of this cup, something on clean cooking. But coal is still, coal use is still increasing, emissions are still going off. In terms of carbon capture and storage, we only capture about 50 million tons. We have to reach one gigaton by 2030, showing that the difference between 50 million ton and one gigaton is quite large. We need, really need to ramp up. Fossil fuel subsidies are, are they are going down from a top in 2022, but we are nowhere near uh, where we want to be in terms of removing uh, fossil fuel sub subsidies. So what needs to be done in terms of going forward? Of course, we need to ramp up investments. And I'm always at, at events like this um, advocating for an increased focus on domestic resource mobilization. We are constantly pointing towards the private sector and expecting the private sector to come up with the resources that we need. And by all means, yes, we need to tap into the private sector. But if we don't get the domestic side right, then the private sector will not come either. So we need to help countries to improve taxation, the way they spend money, redirecting fossil fuel subsidies, and of course, in some parts of the world, also to implement carbon pricing. This is the Human Development Day, and I would really like also to focus on we need to improve the number of people that can actually, or in, and enhance the number of people that can actually work in this sector. So we need to, to focus more on education, especially get girls 
into STEM, uh, because if not, we will not have the people to do what we need to do. We also need to invest a lot more in grid. I think that is going to be the factor that will hinder uh, us in terms of going forward and, of course, generally speaking, in, in terms of uh, facilitating the enabling environment. Of course, the SDG 7 TAG is a UN-appointed group, appointed by UN DESA, and we need to take a look at what the UN itself is doing. We have, of course, UN Energy, which is uh, taking action to sort of coordinate the UN agency's actions in this area. At the same time, we as member states, we lack a platform where we can come together and discuss energy issues. So that's why at least last year we've been calling for this intergovernmental platform. I don't, I just have, based on, on the discussions in New York, we haven't made any headway as of today on this issue. The good news is that our colleagues in New York at least seems to be agreeing on extending the S to the seven decade until 2030. But we did not get the international conference in 2027 that we really wanted. So that means we need to come together and continue to build the case. And hopefully at the end of the day, we will convince some of the key guys in New York to, to support our efforts more widely. But let me again thank you to SDG 7 TAG members for all their hard work. And we're looking forward to continuing these efforts. So Sheila? Maybe I've spoken too much now, but uh, I'll give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Hans. Or should and I? I'm always... Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, Hans, can you hear me? Sheila, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, okay, Sheila. Thank, thank you. I was just saying that I'm always privileged to come... Uh, uh, after Hans has spoken, because he uh, has very well articulated um, uh, key messages from the uh, from the SDG 7 tag and for myself. Um, distinguished guests co and colleagues, uh, I regret that I'm not uh, with you in uh, Banku, but it's an honor to speak to you as we come together to discuss, uh, as already been said, one of the key challenges of our time and that is providing universal access and ensuring a just and inclusive energy transition. As the co-facilitator of the SDG 7 Technical Advisory Group, alongside my colleague hans Olaf Ibrig, I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, session um, at the uh, SDG Pavilion at COP29. And I join Hans in thanking you and Dessa uh, for making this event possible. The sustainable development goal number seven, and just to remind ourselves, is to ensure access to affordable, reliable, and sustainable and modern energy for all, is a foundational pillar of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, as well as the Paris Agreement. It underpins efforts to combat climate change and achieve global equity. However, as already been said, despite its pivotal importance, the current trajectory reveals a significant gap in our progress. Without urgent action, as we have already heard from Hans Olof, the world will fall far short of this critical goal. What is at stake here is not simply energy, but rather SDG 7 is one of the goals which can produce high co-benefits in other areas of sustainable development, delivering on many more development synergies than trade-offs. This includes among others, poverty reduction, good health, water and food security, and employment. For vulnerable populations, these benefits are essential for survival and dignity. A key interlinkage that is particularly important for the work that I do is that between energy and gender equality. Evidence has shown that progress on SDG 5 and SDG 7 are mutually reinforcing empowering women economically in the design, production and distribution of modern energy services, alongside ensuring equal employment opportunities for the clean energy transition, particularly for young women, as Hans Olaf has already alluded to, and the effective representation and leadership of women at all levels of decision-making will generate co-benefits and advance both SDGs simultaneously. In order to boost the overall impacts of energy action, 
We need an in-depth understanding of the challenges and opportunities provided by these interlinkages. And we need to know what measures can be taken to realize their potential. This is why since 2018, the SDG 7 Technical Advisor Group has been working on the analysis of the SDG interlinkages, highlighting effective policy options to decision makers worldwide, including at the high level political forum of sustainable development. As we already heard, the third review of SDG 7 at the HLPF in 2026 provides a focal point for our efforts. We are determined as a tag to work diligently to ensure well-informed policy discussions that will accelerate progress on the ground and facilitate transformative multi-stakeholder partnerships that mobilize action. The upcoming discussions will also provide opportunities for us to start reflecting on the role of energy in a post-2030 framework. In this regard, I'd like to highlight the glaring omission that the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development does not include an indicator on the interlinkages of energy with gender empowerment. Looking forward, it has to be ensured that the important interlinkages between energy and gender will be emphasized strongly and tracked globally, including through a dedicated indicator. To conclude, in our discussion today, I'd invite all of us to highlight opportunities for accelerating progress on SDG 7 and its interlinkages and to reflect on our future aspirations. I strongly believe, and here I believe I'm joined by Hans Olaf, but also by the rest of the tag, that together we can succeed in creating a sustainable, equitable and inclusive energy future. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you, Hansel Love and Sheila, for your interventions and also for your impeccable facilitation of the SDG 7 Technical Advisory Group. We are very appreciative of the work you have done so far uh, with the TAG and we look forward to further collaboration um, uh, in, the, in the future. Now, um, let me turn to our panelists for the next segment of the event. Um, I'd like to ask all the panelists to please join the stage. Uh, let me introduce them briefly. Mr. Hampeng Liu, he's the Director of Energy Division from UNSCAP. Welcome. Uh, Ms. Caroline Oching, she's the Program Officer of IRENA. Ms. Rana Godin, she's the Chief, Div Chief of the Division of Energy and Climate Action at UNIDO. We have Ms. Laura Williamson, she's the Senior Advisor uh, from REN21. And Ms. Hadisa Abdul Mumini, Global Focal Point of SDG7 Youth Constituency. Welcome everyone to the panel. Um, now we have heard uh, from Hans and Sheila clearly that SDG7 is not on track, but there are opportunities ahead of us to accelerate action. One of them is the upcoming SDG7 review that is taking place in 2026. Um, the first question for the panel is, how can we accelerate progress on SDG 7 vis-a-vis -vis the upcoming milestones? And how will your organization contribute to these global efforts? Humpenk, over to you first. Thank you, Bahari, for this question. And also thanks for this opportunity to join the panelists uh, to discuss about how to accelerate SDG 7. That's exactly our key work uh, at the regional level in Asia Pacific. Uh, I, I totally agree with Hans and uh, Sheila. You know, for SDG 7, we are not on track. And especially in Asia Pacific developing countries, uh, we are far behind and to achieve uh, uh, 2030 goals. Uh, just a few data, if we just uh, uh, look at the current situation for uh, universal access, electrification actually, we, we will achieve 100% even before 2030. But the big issue is clean cooking. Currently, we only have 72% of the population with the clean cooking, uh, along with these trends. By 2030, and less than 
So that means we still have 20% of population in Asia Pacific cannot have uh, clean cooking fuels. And for renewable energy, for renewable energy, uh, Asia Pacific actually is leading the global installation of uh, capacity of renewables for last decade. But per capita installation, uh, compared to other regions, Asia and the Pacific is the lowest. We only have uh, 380 watts per capita, but the global average is 420 watts per capita. And uh, even this uh, 380 is one third of the Europe and the uh, US per capita installation. So it's uh, far behind from other uh, region. And for energy efficiency, that's the same situation. And uh, uh, the global average, if we achieve 2030 agenda, we have to achieve 3.8 uh, uh, reduction annually for uh, energy intensity. But for Asia Pacific, for last year, even almost zero. But the, you know, the few year, uh, the last decade was 2.8 percent annually. So it's still far behind. So that means all this uh, target we cannot uh, uh, achieve it. So what we do to support member countries at Asia Pacific region? First, we support them to do this uh, uh, Asia Pacific uh, uh, SDG 7 roadmap. Actually, we already supported the 20 roadmap development, which is mainly to analyze the existing national energy strategies and the target with SDG 7. So uh, uh, what are the gaps and how to fill the gap from the policy side, technology side, and also how much investment needs. And after this roadmap developed, some of the countries actually follow up uh, to use this roadmap to review their own existing national strategies and uh, to improve their existing strategies. At the same time, we also support the implementation of this SDG 7 roadmap by capacity building and the policy dialogue at the uh, national level and the regional level. And also, uh, lastly, I think um, the most important is uh, the investment. So that's uh, probably the major issues for, uh, to accelerate the achievement of SDG 7. Most of the developing countries, government has not enough money to put there. But, but if the government has the right policy, the private sector's investment could be uh, accelerated. And also together with this uh, public-private partnership, I think that could be one option uh, to accelerate uh, SDG 7 uh, implementation. I'll stop here first. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hampeng. Rana, perhaps over to you on efforts that you're leading on at UNIDO on acceleration of SDG 7. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, uh, for inviting me to this and thanks to the colleagues uh, at UNDESA for championing all this through UN Energy and also the SDG 7 uh, tag. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot of, sorry, my microphone is a bit cracking. Is it fine? Okay. <laughs> So um, at UNIDO, we, you know, one thing we see very essential now moving ahead. So we've had a, we've had quite a bit of progress. It's not enough, but I think it's also important to recognize there has been progress, and um, we really see that moving forward, the role of industry in the energy discussion is is a stronger one. So so the linkage between energy transition and industrial transformation has never been more important because at the moment it's not only that the energy technologies are needed to decarbonize the, the heavy industry where we are still lagging, but it's also an opportunity to create new value chains for green energy in uh, emerging uh, economies. So it's not only about providing access to clean cooking, it's not only about providing access to um, uh, lighting, it's really more uh, providing this access to the livelihood and productivity that's going to be important moving forward. And I was just looking here and I see SDG 7 and under it, right under it, SDG 9. And, and actually, it is like that. It is really, really uh, moving ahead. It is very much uh, needed. Now, uh, I think practically as well. Next year, we're looking at the development for financing uh, uh, forum that's going to happen also in, in July. And it's critical for us to build momentum towards the role of energy within that. 
And uh, what we would like to see actually at UNIDO is more of a convergence also among the different UN agencies working with us, possibly to bring in an input from through the International Vienna Energy and Climate Forum coming into the financing for development because what we need indeed, and as Hong Peng said, we need investments. We need investments for NDCs, we need investments for the energy plans, we need investments all, all along the way. So, you know, we'd really love to have that conversation conversation and, and, and bring forward some key recommendations for the financing for development forum. So thanks and I stop here. Thanks so much Rana for your intervention and for also highlighting the financing for development. Uh, that is a critical milestone happening uh, next year in July. Now um, may I ask Caroline to come in? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Yes, so thank you for inviting us to this panel as well. So on your question on how can we ac accelerate progress in the run up to the review, I think first I'll say it's, a, it's a really a good opportunity 2026 for us because uh, it helps to have these checkpoints where we really look what have we achieved, where are we going and what more we can do. And so one of the key areas would be to, from, from IRENA, which is as a global leader in driving the energy transition and the chair of SDG7, is in a strengthening policy advocacy. And uh, we see this as critical because uh, advocacy is what has led us to be here where we are now. Before 2015, there was even no SDG. There was no global target for electrification and clean cooking. It took high level advocacy for that to be achieved. And so yes, with just few remaining years, putting in more efforts towards advocacy and uh, really emphasizing that that time is running out. We see that as a part of how we can contribute to progress. And given that we have 170 member countries that we work with and who also recognize the importance of achieving electrification and clean cooking. So that's one of the areas we'll work on. And then we also want to build capacity, more capacity in this area. Having uh, people who recognize the importance of clean cooking and electrification in decision-making positions within governments, uh, for instance, would take us a long way. So as we build capacity now, we think of 10 years from now, whom will I be engaging with? Is it somebody who I still need to convince that clean cooking is an important agenda to include or not? And to do that takes capacity building. And then there's the improving data and monitoring frameworks. So we are, of course, already doing that as a part of the progress monitoring. But we need to do more in really getting those numbers to tell the story. It's easy to say, okay, 2.1 billion, somebody could easily hear a million instead of billion. And it may not inspire as much, but also sharing what do these numbers mean in terms of what are the health impacts, what is the time opportunity lost for women that uh, Sheila was raising, the gender impacts, the climate impact as well. So better communication of the data and why the, the, the issue should be addressed is also an important area. And then investments, finance and investments, and we've talked about that throughout. It's really g g the, the scale of the problem and the fact that it's concentrated in uh, populations that are poor means that there needs to be different ways beyond market alone that can help address this challenge. And when it comes to electrification, actually the population that now remains without access to electricity are even more harder to reach than those that we have reached. So then we need to consider how can then finance help in this. And uh, I would uh, just like to also highlight uh, 
it's not about people not having money to pay for some of these solutions because they are actually spending more on dirty fuels and for both cooking and lighting. And so it's about the market really not responding well. So it's a market failure that then needs to address. So looking at ways in which public finance can be used to catalyze private sector finance to help address the challenge is important. And then finally, it's the socioeconomics side. So we talk of, uh, we, we work on the energy transition agenda, but uh, there's a need to ensure that uh, it doesn't leave others behind and that it captures all the voices and situations for different populations. And that's also one of the areas we see Irina's work in this area going on would help to contribute to improving the targets. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Carolina. Now, um, Lara, please, over to you. Thank you. I want to build on actually what um, Rana um, was saying, it, to build sort of on the concept of industrialization, but not directly, but, but more sort of to say that I think we need to really understand that in this current um, environment, it's about economic development and industrialization, which means we have to change the narrative. That's not to say that energy access is not important. It is very important. But even in those countries where energy access is still an issue, there is a real need for economic development and industrialization. And I think we have to make sure that we're really keeping our eye on that long-term objective of which energy access is, is, of course, an important part. So then that asks the question, you know, how do we build up this economic basis? Um, how do we, you know, we need to take into account a more integrated way um, to identify the barriers and, and the levers um, and create the benefits that energy brings. Energy is a mechanism by which we can achieve resilient economies and societies. Um, and I think sometimes we, we, we get so focused on the energy question that we lose sight at what is the energy for. And it's like these blocks here. This is what energy is for. Uh, and and I, I think that moving forward, particularly up to 2030, is really sort of stepping back and saying, energy is a public good. How do we assure that? How do we have it as um, the foundation, renewable energy and energy efficiency as the foundation of our resilient economies and societies? For your question about how REN21 can contribute, we've been around for 20 years. And when we were first started, it was to track the real-time uptake of renewables. The renewable energy sector has evolved immensely and it's become uh, nuanced and, and has deepened in many ways. And I think um, but one thing that has constantly held is the importance of multi-stakeholder engagement. And multi-stakeholder being, as my other panelists have, have talked about, is governments, intergovernmental organizations, civil society, business, science, and academia. Um, and it's really about focusing on how do we break down those silos. So events like this, for example, but I think it's also for those of us in the energy sector to be talking to non-energy people. Um, I think in the renewable energy sector, we've had our eye focused so much on the supply side that we've sort of forgotten about the demand side. What is it really for? And there needs to be far more attention on demand sectors, how um, we can um, meet those needs while providing uh, renewable en energy efficiency. Um, and then that also links back to the distribution and the transmission that, that we were talking about. So really stepping back and looking at the whole energy uh, continuum. So we have a task to do between now and 2030. I think we have a responsibility to really step back and um, force ourselves to take this broader perspective and um, maybe not lead with energy, but lead with these broader um, SDG goals of which energy is fundamental. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lara, for highlighting um, the importance of breaking silos and also multi-stakeholder processes, which I think it's a good segue for Hadisa as our youth representative. Over to you, Hadisa. 
Thank you for having us. I'm very really excited to be here. So it's very important that for us to move faster towards achieving SDG 7, it's very important that we carry the youths along. And this is because we're not just the ones that are to benefit from this change. We are the ones that are also going to aid in accelerating this transition. So there's need to support youth-led energy initiatives. There's need for um, allowing you to also be part of the policy making processes because we are, young people are going to be the ones that would face the long impact of all the decisions that are being made now. So it's very important that youth are trained, mentorship um, is provided, training are provided and the skills are also being um, enhanced. At the SDG 7 Youth Constituency, some of the programs that we have in terms of accelerating these are number one, the Youth Sustainable Energy Hub. It's a program that was launched in 2020 and it ran for about a year, almost two, but then it has stopped, but we're working on bringing it back. So the beauty of um, the constituency is that we have members from all part of the world. And you know, with members, they have a lot of people who have their own project. So we provide a platform whereby everybody comes and then a screening is made. Then all these energy um, uh, projects by the youths are being um, showcased. And in the past, we've had support of IRENA, IEA, and the UN organizations. So what they do is they provide funding for some of the projects that they choose. There's also um, opportunity for mentorship and for mentorship, and then there's also um, funding, mentorship, and skilling as well, all of that. So that's one of the programs. We're working on bringing it back. Then the second one is the Youth Exchange Program. So we've come to realize that a lot of people have these ideas, but they just need to sort of broaden their horizon before they're able to achieve it. So the idea of the Youth Exchange Program is that young professional students will be able to be taken to maybe um, ministries in some countries or international energy organizations or universities for just a short-term placement. So they'll be able to sort of see what others are doing, what different stakeholders are doing, and then they can come back home and learn. So these are some of the things we are doing. So in summary, it's very important to remove those barriers, allow you to be part of the policy making process. There's also need to support those ideas so that we can accelerate achieving SDG 7. Thank you. Thank you so much, Disa, for also highlighting the importance of education and, and raising awareness across all sectors of society. Now, um, we have finalized the first round. You all shared incredibly important points about what is needed to achieve SDG 7 by 2030. In the second round, um, I'd like to have a discussion on um, issues that are pertinent from your perspective related to energy that should be considered post-2030. As we move closer to the 2030 timeline, discussions around what the post-2030 regime would look like will kick in. So from your perspective, what are some important aspects of energy that should be considered in, your, in, in those discussions? Han Peng, back to you. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the most important we should continue the momentum for energy transition. So, from the uh, like to accelerate the decarbonization, that means uh, you have to increase renewables, move away from uh, fossil fuels, and improve energy efficiency. That's I really think we should continue and then to scale up. And secondly, I really think we should emphasize energy poverty. So, uh, you know, at one side, energy transition accelerated, but a lot of people left behind. So for those population, for those vulnerable groups, we really need to emphasize to find what is the best option for them. And let them just catch up uh, for this energy transition. That's exactly what we emphasize the just energy transition, inclusive and also sustainable. And the third one, as we discussed quite a lot, is the investment. How to scale up the investment. I think the COP29 here, the discussions about the carbon market and also the new uh, NDCs, the scale up NDCs, that could also create a good opportunity for energy transition. And uh, at the same time, we have to think about uh, you know, the, the energy se sector itself. It's like an integrated development of energy systems. So uh, at the same time, you know, we, we should think about uh, the large scale integration of renewables, like the strong power grid, 
the connected power grid to integrate the more renewables, but also to emphasize on decentralized renewable energy systems for different purposes. So that's I really think you know to balance this energy transition technologies. And also finally, I think we have to emphasize this uh, uh, the gender equality, you know, along with this energy transition, and also involve the youth group. Uh, I really think uh, youth uh, should have their voice because uh, they are the future generation uh, benefit or suffer from this energy transition. You know, they should have their voice. And also recently we, uh, we started a uh, project in Asia Pacific actually to uh, invite the youth group to join our uh, like, uh, uh, policy dialogue with those policy makers and then try to bring the voice from youth group to those uh, policy makers. And that could be you know, the starting point, but I still think there's a long way to go. And uh, there's also uh, uh, opportunities for the uh, youth group to think about how can just uh, you know, mobilize the youth group to actively participate along this process. Uh, that, that's all the aspects I think uh, we should consider post 2030. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I see Hadisa is shaking her head, agreeing with you. So Hadisa, over to you to build on what uh, Hong Feng just mentioned. Um, thank you. All right, so some of the things that I think we should focus are really, yes, the ideas of youth, like starting now and then continuously and up until post 2030, it's very important to look at those ideas. And this is because most of the ideas that you see are coming because some of, of some of the problems that the youth see from their individual communities. So they have passion and some of the problems they see, they want to change it. So it's very important to build on those ideas. And also I think technology, because if we really look at technology at that time, it's going to be one that will also aid us in benefiting everyone. Then it's also important at that point to look at energy in the whole picture in terms of how it improves education, in terms of connecting with poverty and everything in the picture, big picture. That's very, very important. So that's from me. Thanks, Hadita. Lara, maybe we change the order of things. Uh, Over to you. Keep us on our toes. <laughs> um, I, f for me, uh, so, so the, framing, the framing builds on what I said earlier about renewable energy really being an enabler. Um, and reimagining our economies, our, our societies, industrialization, but also the regional cooperation. So I think there's three points um, that I'd like to raise. Green corridors uh, is a good starting point. I'm looking at Rana Ganaim because we have been discussing that. We're partners in crime there uh, because of the needed infrastructure. But we also need to create the regional markets that go with that. So that means taking into account the, the different starting points of, of countries. Uh, you have fossil fuel dependent countries, um, you have countries that have limited infrastructure, um, you have countries that have critical minerals, uh, which brings in a whole nother geopolitical uh, aspect that actually Hans Olaf uh, was referring to the other day. Um, you know, when you have critical minerals, how does that affect sort of regional cooperation? Um, I think then also too, it's very much what I mentioned earlier about linking supply and, and demand. So linking um, the energy supply to the energy consuming sectors. Uh, and then also, you know, given the climate, which is, which is a, a really big issue, um, renewables for adaptation. Um, it's renewables uh, can bring climate resilience. Um, it can also bring, um, Conflict it can, can help with conflict resolution. So from a climate perspective, yes, there's the mitigation aspect of renewables, but I think we also need to really make sure that we look at the adaptation side of, of renewables and the resilience that uh, renewables can bring to, to communities and also they, the role that they can play in uh, conflict, uh, areas of conflict which may have come about uh, due to uh, climate change or energy-related um, activities. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Lara. Rana. Yeah, uh, I mean, echoing all what's said in terms of the, the, the role of energy in the broader and specifically industrial 
development and economic development, the inclusivity. Uh, but I would also add that, um, you know, we need to maybe after COP take a step back <laughs> altogether, <laughs> go on a UN uh, uh, system retreat to really think what is the what is the next step we have because um, I, there's you know since this discussion started like. Uh, 15 years ago on the role of energy it, the, the the discussion has evolved so much and we need to really uh, I mean here maybe a bit you know all the partners in the SDG tag and, and also uh, uh, the UN energy look at what is our com common roadmap uh, towards 2050 I mean for sure 2050 is more about climate and we still hear a lot of countries that are you know discussing and debating is it this option is it that option carbon account becomes a bigger issue as well in terms of the, the competitiveness trade. So how do we help in this like in a more coordinated manner? And there's been a little bit of effort now. For example, we see that under the G20 presidency of Brazil, we saw a global roadmap on clean cooking uh, with roles also of different partners. But I really think that across the board, we can, we need to stop for a moment and um, develop that plan towards 2050 and with a stronger linkage to climate. Excellent, thank you. And just to build on that, this year, the Summit of the Future took place in September um, uh, uh, in the margins of the General Assembly. And uh, the outcome was of that is the Pact for the Future, where member states um, sort of um, outline their vision for the future. and both universal energy access and what now we call here the energy transition package are included in the pact. So this is a signal of uh, the direction in which we may be going. And, and I fully agree with you, Rana, reflection on that is important. Now, um, Caroline, please, over to you. Yes, so, so I fully agree as well with what other panelists have said. So post 2030, we're actually still going to have 1.9 billion people without access to clean cooking, nearly 500 million without access to electricity. So it means we need to continue the efforts going on now. And we should also at times step back and uh, see some positive progress that have been achieved. So there are things we've been doing right because uh, so there's been a, a huge reduction in number of people without access to electricity. So those need to continue. It would be good post 2030 to start focusing on quality, not just the numbers, but what quality of, of access are these populations getting. And for this, we need to start uh, again linking with what uh, everyone says. We need to start looking at energy as a service. What service do we need it to deliver, whether it's health, whether it's uh, improved uh, education, communication, opportunity to run businesses and so on. And with that kind of view, then uh, it's not just about a household has one uh, light bulb that's powered by solar, but uh, higher tiers of electrification, for instance, that then enables all these other services to be achieved. I think it will be good to break down a little bit the numbers in terms of uh, when we talk, okay, 2.1 billion uh, lacking clean cooking, 685 million lacking electricity access, that population is so heterogeneous, which means uh, it requires different sets of solutions. And so uh, a better segmentation of populations in terms of rural, urban, uh, different socioeconomic groups would then help to know which solutions would work best for which areas and which ones would not. So that then it's not trial and error and we are likely then to see more success. And then I'll end, yes, we need more investments for us for these targets to be achieved. Thank you so much, Carol, and thanks to all of you. I think um, between the five of you, I think you're ready to craft already the post-2030 goal on, on energy. And um, before I hand it over to uh, Mr. T Minoru Takada, let me thank our panelists one more time. It's past 6 p.m. here in Baku, 
And thanks for joining us. And let me also thank you for your contribution to UN Energy, which, as Hans Olaf mentioned, is an interagency mechanism within the UN to coordinate activities of the UN system on energy. And each of these UN Energy members and partners have contributed significantly to the uh, progress on SDG 7, including mobilizing 1.3 um, billion uh, in, in, in financing via energy compounds. With that, I'd like to now hand it over to Mr. Minoru Takada. He's the UN Energy Sec um, Secretary from the Department of Economic and Social Affairs to close off the event. Minoru, over to you. Thank you. Um, before I do so, you can stay here. Right. <laughs> I have a guest here. Uh, the way, who is, uh, of course, a you know, distinguished member of UN Energy, and uh, I would like to invite him to say a few words, joining, you know. Uh, would you like to pick up a you know, microphone? And then, you know? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minoru, for inviting me to give this uh, like, uh, without any uh, notification. I just passed by and uh, realized our <laughs> UN uh, energy members are here talking about this important topic. I just want to contribute a little bit that is, uh, as a member of the UN Energy uh, International Atomic Energy Agency has been working closely with all our partners here, including our UNIDO colleagues in Vienna and also UN uh, ISCAP and UNDISA and also others. So uh, we actually are ready to continue our contribution to that uh, UN uh, collective efforts because we have this very unique uh, you know, uh, expertise in energy planning. We have been working with all these um, uh, UN partners, including our uh, IRENA colleagues, which are not really in the, within the UN, but uh, we work with them closely on this, try to support all these uh, targets uh, under the UN uh, SDGs and also the Climate Paris Agreement. Because I, I think the, the signal from the COP28 is very clear, that is we need all the uh, available solutions to support this uh, uh, very ambitious target for 2030 and uh, 2050. And uh, we, we see the nuclear can also contribute, because if you see what happened in at the beginning of this COP, to 13 November, we have this uh, important, uh, uh, you know, events uh, with the COP29 presidency uh, talking about the financing low carbon technology, including nuclear energy. So all this important head of the international organization, in addition to the energy minister of Azerbaijan, joined that one, including IEA, uh, UNECE, and uh, ARENA, and also some others. So I think so that we include this inclusive and collective, uh, you know, uh, efforts happened in this COP29 as well. So uh, I just came back from another uh, Azerbaijan event and they talk about also the, what they can do in the coming uh, you know, decades, talking about all these resources, including the nuclear. So we have some uh, kind of a, uh, you know, discussion on, in order to make sure the nuclear can really release the potential, we need all these uh, uh, you know, uh, efforts together with uh, uh, stakeholders. But I think so from a nuclear perspective, we think nuclear can really contribute to the more penetration of the renewable in the coming decades to make sure renewable can release its potential and nuclear can also release its potential as well. So we are ready to continue to work with our UN partners and UN energy members so together to contribute this uh, global net zero targets uh, by 2050. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you can hear me, right? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so three things here. Number one, we are all talking about this energy agenda in the most inclusive way. And uh, where we have most inclusive agenda, we have United Nations. So let me say three things on the hat of the United Nations. Number one, under the United Nations hat, we have sustainable development goals. In this particular case, SDG 7. So we will have to make sure SDG 7 gets achieved. So this is a number one priority for all of us to focus on. And I think we cannot forget about this one. And then many of you already emphasized the need for this one. Second, General Assembly just decided to extend UN decade of sustainable energy for up to 2030, precisely because SDG 7 needs to be accelerated. So we as a UN system, member states, uh, you know, like-minded have a job to do. What do we want under the, under the extended decade? We need a work plan here. Can we take this one as an opportunity to elaborate in a way to address some of your good ideas? I like your idea of retreat, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, to elaborate further. 
The lastly, in 2027, as part of the decision of the Summit of the Future, member states will decide on the way forward as to how they're going to discuss post-2030 agenda. So by the time we get to the September 2027, we energy community needs to be ready to engage. Ready to engage, not to just to engage, engage with clear ideas and some options. So we have about two and a half years to go before we get there. So you can see that next two to three years is going to be enormously important. So I hope that we can continue to work together to push this agenda, not only to deliver on the SDG 7, we must, but of course, to start thinking about long term toward 2040, 2050. I know with your collective experiences and wisdom, we can bring all the things together to get largest agenda called energy to be at the heart of 2030 agenda and post 2030 agenda. With this, and with thanks to everybody who are listening and who are here in the room, thank you very much. I would like to close this session. Thank you very much.